Playpen Podcast. Chapter 5 Not a Scratch There are those who create and those who do not. Of those who do, there are select few, like Joe, who should not. Even amongst the should-nots, you can still find a handful who at least try to make something distinct and fresh, while the many Joes of the world choose to play it safe with never-ending mountainous piles of rehashed garbage. This is one of the many reasons I harbor such an intense hatred for him, and those like him. No vision at all. Personally, I've never seen the point in trying to produce something if it doesn't at least strive to be unique in some way. Joe, on the other hand, would happily put out any hunk of shit that sloppily fell from his shit-filled head. In his pee of a brain, he felt that having something completed and out was better than taking the extra time to perfect it beforehand. This is why many lost souls in the industry he was attempting to become part of mistakenly viewed him as a high-output workhorse. Sure, he released a lot of content, but had low-quality standards for his art, and his writing was clunkier than a knight sprinting in heavy armor. In my opinion, Joe, the tit, consistently insulted his readers with character names like Queen Killtits and Garblonzo, but like I said before, this isn't about me. I wouldn't be putting you folks through this drivel, that's for damn sure. This story is all over the place, too. The only character I initially had any interest in was Batricus, who I couldn't believe came from the feeble mind of Joe. As far as I was concerned, the frog thread was the single saving grace of this piece, but I know, I know, this isn't about me. Back to Unkillable Joe, the dysfunctional tale about an idiot who wrote himself into being one of the most powerful forces ever known, and still somehow managed to fuck it all up. Oh goody. Kiltits began to help Joe clean the wreckage that was formerly his apartment, and even attempted to make small talk with her gun-shy creator, without continually slapping his extremely slappable face. She would be the first to admit it was difficult to resist the overwhelming urge, but she noted the lack of smacking seemed to aid with their communication. Her hands hurt anyway, so for the first time she could remember, she found herself relieved by a temporary hiatus in violence. So, she shakily began, you live here alone? He examined a brand new hole in the wall he recently traveled through. Yeah, my girlfriend moved out a few months back, so now it's just me here. He shrugged like an asshole. You think these broken pipes are important? Shocked to hear that any woman would be with someone like Joe, she had to ask, Your girlfriend? What was she like? Mean, mostly, and horrible. Oh. Well, sorry about your place. It's cool. He looked even more pathetic when he forgave her with a dismissive wave of his stupid hand. Shit happens. Surprised by the casual response, the silver-haired woman was compelled to say more. You know, I'd be livid if someone invaded my home, demolished it, bested me in unarmed combat, then slapped me around until their hands hurt, but that's just me. Aw, your hands hurt? He flashed her one of his world-famous imbecilic grins. Well, it wasn't the coolest thing you could have done, but I'm sorry too. You're sorry? For what? I guess I'm sorry for giving you an unoriginal name, and designing you to look like a cartoon version of a porn star. That snapped her out of the peaceful moment. You guess? No, you're right. That is worse. Much worse. Fuck you, asshole. He foolishly pushed ahead. I couldn't have known you were real, so I just made you in the way I thought would be coolest on page, and also the most marketable. I mean, I like big breasts and all, but now that I'm saying how ridiculous those things are in person, smack, my bad. I'm just saying, I get why you're upset. I don't think you do. Her voice was shrill. Do you know what it's like to fight with these things constantly in the way? He could never tell when to shut up, and continued to wholeheartedly agree with her. That must suck. Do you, like, have to sleep on your back or something? She took aim at his head with a hefty glass ashtray, and he ducked like a dumbass. Deciding against it, she stopped herself. What's the point? The ashtray fell to the carpeted floor with a dull thud. It's not like I can even harm you anyway. Slowly, his aggravatingly green eyes opened back up. Wait, what did you just say? Isn't it obvious? She slapped her thighs. I can't defeat you. But you just kicked my ass for the last hour. Yeah, and look at you. Not a scratch. No bruises. You should be dead. He regarded his reflection in the shard of a broken mirror and could see that she was right. His irritating face didn't have a mark on it, and he also felt no pain of any kind. The average sized moron turned back to her like a failed actor in his final audition. What does this mean? How do you not know, oh great creator? I thought you made all of... Her arm swept the room. This. Not the part you're standing in. This is my reality. You shouldn't be here. How is this even possible? Can you explain it? The mighty queen seized Joe by the shirt and pinned him to the wall. Apparently, Garblonzo transmitted his power to you just before I... Ended him. How do you not know this? Didn't you make up the part where he gave you the power? No, I just said it would go to someone worthy. 
I didn't specify who. She wasn't convinced of his innocence, mainly because he looked like he was lying, but she let it go for the time being. Yeah, right. Well, since you now have the number one power and you're also my creator, her face scrunched at the word, I may not be able to injure you. Picking up the pieces of a broken chair, she added, perhaps no one can, for my universe anyway. So you're not going to kill me? She dropped the pieces of chair, moved closer, and fixed his hair, causing all the blood from his head to migrate south. Kiltitz leveled her amethyst eyes with his moronic malachites. Do you need me to spell it out for you? She pressed herself against him, and the sum of his knowledge temporarily drained from his conscious mind. Joe, you may be unkillable. Unsure how to behave in the face of his ultimate fantasy, he kissed it. Predictably, she moved to slap him, but when he grabbed a fistful of her hair, the queen surprised herself by instinctually kissing him back. Okay. Chapter 5 in the books. Moving on. <clears throat> Chapter 6 Gods of a Feather Somewhere in the deep reaches of space, a small group of gods hovered in a semicircle. They were brought together by an urgent summons from the one they all answered to, the one none of them would dare disobey. The One. The discussions of deities rarely have anything to do with the affairs of mortals, but this particular conversation centered around, of all things, Joe. It's important to note that a frog was also briefly mentioned. When the colloquy concluded, the immortals went about their business and dispersed back to their respective corners of the universe. Minus One. A brutish-looking ancient with an enormous battle axe strapped across his broad back. It glowed with a pulsating power of its own. The giant's square jaw clenched tight as he sped through space at roughly 10 trillion miles per second. A cosmic boom rippled from his wake and was felt by all in the galaxy who were sensitive to such things. Everything about the hulking brute exuded power, and a sense of purpose propelled him towards, of all places, Earth. Oodles and oodles of light years away, a small frog continued his discussion with an extremely ancient demon. The words which fell from the time-worn skull seemed to originate from some far-off place. His speech was broken and jagged, as though pushed aside by a tired wind before finally reaching the frog's sensitive to Pena. Nonetheless, Batricus clearly understood their meaning. What do you want? It seethed. From about thirty-six inches lower, the amphibian fearlessly answered, What any warrior wants? The power to destroy my enemies. Bemused, the dead man came back with, What enemies could a frog have? Snakes? Presently, yes, he admitted. But who knows what the future holds for one of my ambition? At this, Batricus's face stretched itself into a knowing grin. The dusty skull tipped back and let loose a boom of ghostly laughter that danced about the cave. You entertain, it continued, but sadly have nothing to offer me. How dare you! The hairy frog roared in a voice that rattled the exposed ribcage of the ancient. The skeleton flinched at the outburst, the first time he had done so in ages. The diminutive champion explained that he would happily put his very soul up for schooling in the arts of dark witchery. Demanding the demon help him discern the manner in which the dead could be controlled, he reasoned it was an even trade for such instruction. Alas, frogs have no souls, the dead man pointed out with a trace of sadness. Although this might be true for a great majority of frogs throughout the swamp and by extension the rest of the world, Batricus was no common frog. He was a wolverine frog, and no ordinary wolverine frog at that. Right from birth, he could understand certain things the rest of his kin weren't able to grasp within the span of an entire lifetime. He never knew why, but he always possessed a strong yearning for power and knowledge that was unlike the rest of his clutch. Even as a tadpole, he had a steel trap for a memory. This particular wolverine frog never forgot, and never forgave, those who crossed and or tried to eat him. Deep down in his heart, Batricus considered himself a righteous warrior, and lived his life accordingly. In an ill-fated attempt to explore the world beyond, he was besieged by the snake just as he managed to work his way to the edge of the swamp. It was the chain of events which followed that led him face to face with a crusty demon nearly as old as mankind itself. Batricus still considered himself fortuitous, however. In this elder monster, he saw a master who could potentially grant him the secrets to ultimate supremacy. He pleaded for the skeleton to consider him for training, and after a long, motionless pause, the dead man at last agreed. A pact was formed. Over 3,000 miles away, Joe, the luckiest idiot alive, was doing naughty things with a woman so far removed from his league that he was dizzied by the reality of it all. Much, much further away than that, a demigod rocketed himself towards Earth at a speed that admittedly made him feel pretty dizzy too. And that's it. That's it, guys. So apparently Joe and uh, Kiltitz have hooked up here. Uh, she has admitted she is unable to kill him. 
Uh, he has the number one power, apparently, and he's also her creator, and by extension, she can't take him out. Um, and then we also checked in with Batricus, who has now um, gotten the the bone demon to agree to train him in the dark arts of necromancy. So thank you everybody for tuning in, uh, to the audio book version of unkillable Joe, the free version we do have. And this is read by me, the author, Joe Valen. And, uh, you know, you can locate the book on Amazon and everywhere else. I think we do have someone in mind to read the official audio book that will be available for purchase. I just wanted to have a free version up. Um, albeit on YouTube, and I do apologize for any commercials you have to endure, but um, this was just a really simple way I could think of that it's a project I can do myself, and a lot of people wanted me to read it. However, I'm not a, a professional by any means, so we are considering hiring someone for the official audiobook. But other than that, we appreciate you subscribing, tuning in, listening to the podcast, promoting yourselves in the comments, and... Um, that's about it, guys. Just stay safe, and we'll see you next time for the next two chapters. Chapter 7 and 8, it really starts heating up, and I can't wait to get to it. See you next time. time, time. The Maypen Podcast.